morning I'm going to talk about thoughtfulness. Not the kind of thoughtfulness which enables you to remember your mother's birthday or your wedding anniversary, although they are critically important. No, it is a, a more general kind of thoughtfulness, a kind of thoughtfulness which I think we need to encourage in our population, in our citizenry, and in particular in those who represent us in Parliament and in government. It is the kind of thoughtfulness which can, when prudently exercised, prevent public policy disasters. It can, at its extreme, prevent wars. It is the kind which will be necessary if our species, over the course of the next century, is to confront the, the key existential challenges which will face us, including food and water shortages and energy policy. What is it? Well, the thoughtfulness I'm referring to is the ability and the inclination to approach a problem on its own merits, to see the facts which surround it, unencumbered as possible by prejudice, preconceived notions, and ideology, and to try and analyze it and come up with a solution for it. History is unfortunately replete with the examples of the consequences of unthoughtfulness. And of course, the most classic example comes from Germany in the 1930s. This great country, the intellectual epicenter of Europe in many ways, the center of philosophy, physics, and medicine, collectively suspended its thoughtfulness, suspended its analytical qualities, and bought into a facile, simplistic idea that all of their problems, economic, political, geopolitical, cultural, medical, microbiological, were all caused by one race of people who needed to be persecuted and, as we know, genocidally exterminated. The consequences of that same lack of thoughtfulness, it can be argued, came back and bit them later. Because one of the things which Hitlerian rejection of, of Jewish people resulted in was a rejection of what he perceived as Jewish science, which included physics, and all of the great works of physics which emanated from the original observations made by, by Einstein. And of course, the mass exodus of the great Jewish scientists from Germany and from Germany, German culturally influenced countries resulted in the loss of the technology, the skills, which ultimately enabled the West to develop the atom bomb, which thankfully the Nazis never did. A little further to the East, we had the example of Lysenko, who was not a stupid man. He was a scientist. He was a geneticist who was responsible for policies of plant genetics in the old Soviet Union and whose crackpot theories about genetics resulted in wholesale crop failures, mass starvation, and the deaths of millions of Soviet citizens. In fact, it could be argued on a somewhat larger scale that the entire Marxist enterprise, which, led, which inspired so many governments that ultimately by the approximately two-thirds of the way through the last century, more than one-half of the population of the world lived in governments, lived under the rule of governments which were to an extent inspired by Marxism, was in fact a very unthoughtful philosophy, which was based on a, a facile determinism and an inevitability of things which, as scientists will tell you, were never inevitable at all. By way of contrast, and I'm delighted to see my friend and, and colleague, Dr. Rona Mani, mentioning JFK, because I think that the very same example that, that she has quoted in support of courage is also in support of thoughtfulness. Because remember, the JFK in 1962, when he found out that for the first time in the history of the United States, he, as a young and experienced president who had just made a colossal, colossal foreign policy disaster when he implemented the Eisenhower plan to invade Cuba at the Bay of Pigs, suddenly found to their shock that 90 miles offshore was the thermonuclear capacity to basically kill every American in every city in the eastern seaboard and Midwest. And he was surrounded by hotheads. He was surrounded by people who said, bomb them, nuke them, invade them, invade them in Europe, do all of these things. And he didn't. As Rona said, he held the line, but he thoughtfully initiated backdoor channels, front door channels, set up negotiation, and opted for the less aggressive option of the blockade, as opposed to the direct military action, which very nearly occurred, and which we all now know now would have had potentially disastrous consequences. As a result of this thoughtful approach, when he was getting bad advice on all sides, there was wriggle room for both himself and Khrushchev to back down, to save face in their respective constituencies, and to allow the missiles to be quietly dismantled, while 
S similar missiles that the Americans had in place in Turkey and Italy were also quietly dismantled. There are other, I should say, less extreme and more proximate examples of the influence of unthoughtfulness on public policy. The United States, arguably currently the greatest educational powerhouse in the world, and we've all seen how they've done rather poorly in league tables of primary and secondary schools, but still their great institutions of higher learning routinely dominate all of the league tables of the great universities. They win more Nobel Prizes, they spend more money on R&D, they have more innovation, they have more output. Educationally, a wonderful country in many ways. But yet, 46% of Americans believe that the world is less than 6,000 years old. They believe that humans and dinosaurs coexisted, probably, in fact, walking up the entry gantry and to Noah's Ark at the same time. Um, these are the people who elect the government. As well as that, we have closer to home an outbreak of measles occurring in the UK. Why? This country, which has produced more Nobel Prizes per head of population than any country in the world, which has the greatest research output per head of population of any country in the world, which has some of the world's most famous medical schools, many of its citizens allowed themselves to be deluded into believing that it was safer not to vaccinate their children than to vaccinate them because of entirely unscientific evidence uh, which suggested that there was a higher risk of mental handicap. Now, were these the actions of an informed and thoughtful group of people? These were not. What about Chernobyl? This is critically important. We are, as I said, one of the big existential crises I believe facing our species will be energy policy. If we get this wrong, we're in big trouble for a whole lot of reasons, both geopolitical because of the wars that will end up being fought overall because of global warming, whether you believe in it or not, there's no doubt that polluting the environment with carbon ain't such a great idea. And if for no other reason, when those carbon resources are finite, they will run out at some stage. And even if the worst thing that happens to us with energy is that we just run out of it, society will cease to function. So in looking at things like nuclear policy, you will hear serious, informed, educated politicians saying, we can't do it. Look what happened in Chernobyl. Look at all of those deformed children. Look at all of the congenital malformations. But yet all of the data, not compiled by crazy zealots of the nuclear industry, but compiled by the United Nations expert group and verified by every epidemiological study which has been done, has shown that the increase in the number of congenital malformations following Chernobyl was zero. It was the same after Chernobyl as it was before Chernobyl. It's the same in Chernobyl as it is in Cork or Wicklow or Tennessee. There is no increase. There was an increase in thyroid cancer with, the, with few exceptions, all of which were cured, but there was no increase in congenital malformations. But charities raise money in support of getting kids away from this risk, and we're told that we can't have nuclear energy. While every day in the world, Thousands of people die as a result of hydrocarbon energy every day. People are burned, boiled, blown up, die in wars, overturned in oil tankers. All of these things happen on a daily basis. But even though we know the facts are there, we choose rather unthoughtfully not to look at them. The Iraq war, I think, provides the greatest example of unthoughtfulness in modern history. Why did a large, sophisticated, relatively well-educated country like the United States, led by a leader like George Bush, decide in 2003 to launch a war in retribution about the September 11th attacks against people that had nothing to do with the September 11th attacks? It was, as John Kerry said at the time, a bit like if America had in 1941 suffused with righteous rage and indignation after Pearl Harbor decided to invade Mexico. Um, it was truly an absurd thing to do. And of course, we were told it was because of oil. I never buy that. It would have been cheaper to buy the oil. We are told that it was because Bush was stupid. Well, Bush isn't that stupid. His IQ test records, both from the military and from his entrance to college and to graduate school, indicate that he was of above average intelligence, probably in the 120 plus range. He was, however, incredibly unthoughtful. Every analyst who has ever studied this man has come to the same conclusion, that he had a good memory, he was quick in his feet, he wasn't dumb, but he was incurious, he was unanalytical, he was uninquisitive, he was very prone to accepting simplistic solutions and solistic ideologies that were put on him. But how did the Americans let him get away with it? And this is what I think is rather worrying. And this brings us to what I believe is the core of the problem, the great enemy of thoughtfulness, which is ideology, and prejudice and the concept of values bundling, something which is called, I think, heuristics in, in the psychology literature. 
And basically, I'll give you an example. If you go into any town hall square in America where a political debate is taking place, if somebody stands up and expresses their opinion about whether evolution should be taught in schools, there is an extremely high likelihood that you can predict what their opinion will be on gun control, on abortion, on military spending, on taxes, and on gay marriage. And it is hard to escape the conclusion that many people in America at the time that Bush was elected, who for reasons which were not political, which might have been cultural, which might have been personal, which might have reflected a disapproval of his, of his personal conduct, didn't like Bill Clinton, decided that George Bush was the antidote that they would have. This was a man who had their values. And if George Bush and his advisor said, we should invade Iraq, by golly, we're going to be with him because he's our man. And this, I believe, is one of the most critically dangerous things which happens. And it, it makes people suspend entire levels of their critical faculties and their thinking processes and to accept things because they might have thought some other part of the guy's policy through and have agreed with it. This had colossal consequences for America. Simplistic voodoo economics. You know, the old idea of increasing this military spending while you decrease taxes at the same time led to America's economy ultimately uh, becoming debt-fueled and collapsing. This happens here too. <clears throat> I think it's fair to say around Leinster House we have several groups of people who are, I believe, very guilty of this. Uh, and even in general in Irish culture, uh, it was pointed out to me recently that with a high degree of likelihood, if you know somebody's position on the Gaza blockade, it is also likely that you can predict their position on fracking in Leitrim. People do tend to assume whole sets of values without actually going through them in detail. And our political system heavily incentivizes this because we have this bizarre situation in Ireland where what are historically our two dominant political parties are ideologically indistinguishable. Uh, even if they had some level of ideology, which might, I guess, to an extent suspend thoughtfulness, you'd worry a little bit, but it's worse. They're just like two wholly artificial factions of people who have come together, in many cases because of culture, in many cases because of family, in many cases because of personal history or taste. And they're entirely capable of flipping their positions past each other like demented skiers going down a slalom slope at election time. In general, when you're in opposition, you will be in favour of increasing spending on everything, and when you're in government, you'll curtail it. And as soon as the government of the opposition switch places, the position switch as well. I see it all the time in the Shannon where there are people you know have expressed opinions contrary to some piece of legislation or some motion which is being advocated, but they're whipped into silence and have to go along with it. It is, I believe, very, very dangerous. Um, I, I'm reminded before the 2007 election, at a time when I was not involved in, in the Shannon, but I was writing for a newspaper, and at the time I had very, very strong and very negative opinions about the, uh, the behaviour, the policies, and the general competence of the previous Fianna Fáil and, and PD government, and was vigorously advocating for a change of government, main, mainly because of the issue of health care reform. And, and I, I, after the election, was doing a ward round, and a, quite a sick lady in her bed said, you know something, I voted for Fianna Fáil all my life, she said, all my life. And I read your articles, and I, I agree with you, I think they've done a really bad job. I think they need some time out of government. I think they need to, number one, be punished, and they need to fix their house, etc. But you know, I went into that ballot box, and I had a pencil in my hand. And I could feel my dead mother's hand on mine, directing it to the X. And there just was no way that I could change it. So there are people, I think, who are capable of stepping outside that kind of herd mentality, that kind of heuristic values bundling. I think Obama is an extremely good example of it. He's basically somebody who I believe has, in general, his instincts are in the American political sphere towards the left but he's capable of analyzing individual problems and taking non-ideological positions about it. And in fact, I think in his first inaugural address, he put it best when he said the issue is not about big government or small government, it's about government being good and doing the best it can in the situations when it should do it. Closer to home, our own faculty colleague, Professor Morgan Kelly, like a voice in the wilderness, was crying out for years that we were heading towards a major economic disaster. But our two group-thinking, non-thoughtful major political parties mutually cheer-led cheer -led themselves and the entire country into a financial disaster by inflating the housing bubble. So how will we fix it? Well, funnily enough, I think a key part of this is teaching everybody science. Not because I want everybody to be a scientist, but I think science is not just that arcane, esoteric art practiced by geeky nerds in white coats, although it is. It is also, it is also the language of the universe. Everybody learns science. Everybody as a child learns that fire burns, water drowns, things fall down, not up. 
Uh, and these are all scientific observations. And I think we need to include science in every year of everyone's education until the day they leave school, even if they're going to be lawyers or artists or poets or dramatists or politicians. They need to know science. Number one, because they need to know enough about it to help make the increasingly scientific big decisions which we'll need to make and to elect people who know what they're talking about. But as well as that, it's the process. It's the analysis. Scientists in general, and trust me, we're not immune to it, we try to suspend prejudice. We try to look at a problem. We try to say, I wonder if we put these two drugs together in this dish with these cancer cells, will they stop growing? And if they don't, why will they? And if the result is not the one we want, we still publish it, we still present it, and we try to work out why we were wrong. Whereas people who don't take a thoughtful approach will decide in advance what the outcome is that they want, and then we'll try and jury fit the, fa fit the facts to fit it. So in conclusion, I would say that it is critically important that we, number one, change our political system to encourage people to think independently. And remember, there was a dissenting voice in 2003 at the time of the invasion of Iraq. There was a senator who spoke against it, a very young senator from Illinois, Barack Obama. Hillary Clinton didn't speak against it. She voted for it. But he actually did at the time have the thoughtfulness to know this is the wrong war at the wrong time. So we need to fix our politics. And we're trying to do that with some reform at the moment, which I won't go into today. We also need to fix our education system. We need to make sure everybody does science and does maths. But I think at a cultural level, we have to encourage in our youth that capacity to say, why? Why did this happen? What's going on here? Not just to accept the whole baskets of ideologies which are handed to our kids in schools. Thank you very much for your time today. Bye-bye. <laughs>